again, everyone. This is Allison Bateman now. Sorry to keep you waiting. Um, so here's the update. One of our speakers, Dr. Peter Marks from the FDA, as you can imagine, is very busy with COVID uh, vaccines at the moment, and he is on an urgent call and will be joining us as soon as he gets off that call. So he's still talking, and we're still going to uh, look forward to hearing what he has to say, but we're reordering the agenda, and Pat Furlong, who was going to be our respondent, is going to go first. So without any further ado, we're going to dive into this, and we thank you for bearing with us uh, in trying to present this event in the time of COVID. So hello, as I've already said, and welcome to the first day of our week-long lunchtime lecture series, Ethical Issues in Pediatric Gene Therapy Clinical Trials, which, as the name applies, is happening every day this week from noon to 1 p.m. Eastern Time. Today, we are talking about risk and benefits in pediatric gene therapy research, and I'll say more about today's event in just a moment. First, however, I wanna invite you to join us tomorrow to talk about equity issues in pediatric gene therapy research. And if you haven't already registered for that, the registration is still open and more information can be found on our Eventbrite page. We'll drop the URL in the chat, so look there for it. This lecture series is brought to you by the NYU Grossman School of Medicine Division of Medical Ethics Working Group on Pediatric Gene Therapy and Medical Ethics, or since that's a very long name, PGTME. You can find more about PGTME on its webpage, and again, we'll drop the URL for that in the chat, or you can just Google NYU PGTME, or you can sign up for PGTME's quarterly newsletter to stay abreast of our work. We'll also let you know when this webinar will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. And yes, that means this event is being recorded. We regret that we are unable to offer real-time transcription of this event, but the archive video will have captions for anyone who has difficulty following along. My name is Allison Bateman, as I, Allison Bateman House, as I already said, and I'm an assistant professor in the Division of Medical Ethics at NYU Grossman School of Medicine. I'm also a co-chair of PGTME and delighted to bring you this event. Today's event on risk and benefits in pediatric gene therapy research and the ethical issues that arise related to these will, as I mentioned, feature a presentation by Dr. Peter Marks, who I see has joined us and who I will introduce momentarily. During Dr. Marks's presentation, please submit your questions via the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. After his presentation, there will be a brief response by Pat Furlong, who I will also introduce momentarily. After both of our speakers have their turns, I will host a Q&A using the questions that you submit through the Q&A feature. Please do it through the Q&A feature, not the chat. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce first our respondent and then our speaker. And now uh, we're reverting to the original order. We're gonna have uh, Dr. Mark speak first and have Pat respond, but let me just introduce both of them. So Pat Furlong is the founding president and CEO of Parent Project Muscular Dystrophy, the largest nonprofit organization in the United States solely focused on Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Ms. Furlong founded PPMD in 1994 with other parents of young men with Duchenne, intending to change the course of the disease and ultimately to find a cure. Together, they accelerate research, raise their voices in Washington, demand optimal care for all young men and educate the global community about Duchenne. Welcome to Pat. And our initial speaker is Dr. Peter Marks. Dr. Marks is the director of the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research or CBER at US Food and Drug Administration. He joined the FDA in 2012 as deputy director for CBER and became director in 2016. Dr. Marks is board certified in internal medicine, hematology and medical oncology and he received his medical degree and graduate degree in cell and molecular biology, I am proud to say, from NYU. Dr. Marks is a fellow of the American College of Physicians, and I would like to thank him very much for joining us today, especially in the midst of COVID-19 vaccine-related uh, issues. And I now turn the mic over to him. Great, thanks so much. and. Uh... I apologize for uh, a little bit of a connection problem here. Hopefully uh, we're now all okay here. I'm gonna just get to share my screen here to get up my slides and hopefully everyone can see them now. Okay, so I, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. Um, uh, and uh, I'll, I'll talk to you about the development of uh, 
gene therapy for p rare pediatric disorders. And, I'll, and although my slides may not seem like they focus a lot about risk benefit, I'm gonna to try to make sure we focus uh, a lot on, on how we come to where we come to um, in this area. So I'll try to um, make the case for addressing rare pediatric disorders um, uh, in the gene therapy world. Um, talk about product development and benefit risk assessment as we think about those products. Um, give an overview of, of gene therapy product development as we go along and how we might have potential pathways forward to deal um, with gene therapies for relatively uncommon disorders. So really, just to make the case here, the importance of, of, of therapies for disorders that are very rare is really when you think about it, out of thousands of rare hereditary and acquired diseases, there are currently hundreds of disorders affecting one to a few dozen people that could actually be addressed with novel therapies such as gene therapies. And if we really think about it in terms of the paradigm that we're dealing with, when you start to think at the molecular level, many of the genes defects that make, some up, make up some of the uh, uh, common disorders or more common disorders are actually a spectrum of different disorders. So there are uh, many small uh, disorders that comprise one larger one. So if we are able to get it right for very uncommon disorders, um, we may be able to then uh, have something that will give us the tools to deal with some of the more common disorders. So I, I would make the case that it's the right thing to do in the first place, um, uh, but there are also um, a lot of potential benefits of addressing very uncommon disorders for the larger uh, population as well. Um, now, in terms of FDA, we are uh, responsible for ensuring that medical products are safe and that they meet a standard for efficacy. Um, but, it, it, but that means for us at, at FDA, which is somewhat different than other regulatory agencies around the globe, is that we're involved in the process of product development right from concept for many of these products on throughout uh, to post-marketing surveillance. So we really do have kind of a cradle, um, uh, in, in some cases it's almost like fetus, um, but cradle uh, to a grave approach to, um, uh, to our products. Um, we do that in uh, an ecosystem with a variety of stakeholders um, that are very important, patients and families, advocacy organizations, researchers and physicians, uh, pharmaceutical and biotechnology companies who work with us and trade organizations. Uh, and, and these slides, which uh, um, uh, Allison can feel free to distribute, and uh, they, their links here are to our web pages at FDA, which uh, can uh, amplify some of the concepts I'm, I'm, I'm talking about. Um, when we think about drug development milestones, there's obviously discovery, there's preclinical research, also sometimes called non-clinical research, um, clinical research, regulatory review, and post-market surveillance. Um, and I wanna just take you through briefly kind of how this might work and where it's subtly different perhaps for gene therapies than, than conventional drugs. So discovery uh, often in the, in the older world, pre-gene therapy would involve the screening of compounds to find those that might have an effect on a disease or condition. Uh, it could also be repurposing existing products to treat a disease entity. Um, but what we now have um, is with gene therapies, um, uh, something that really falls more into the category of new insights from research with the disease that can allow rational product design. The rational tool we have is the gene therapy vector uh, that's constructed using um, uh, both an insert and some uh, vector, be it a viral or non-viral vector. Um, and that, that manipulation of genetic material um, really uh, allows us to make targeted therapies in a way uh, that we were not able to previously. Now, before a product is used in humans, we usually have to evaluate for toxic effects and see if it has uh, also, we wanna see that it has the potential to have a beneficial effect on the condition being studied. Um, uh, there are two major types of preclinical research that go on. Uh, one is in vitro, that's either done in cells or tissue culture and in vivo preclinical research, which, is, or which are done in animal experiments. Um, and increasingly though, we're starting to see 
cases where possibly in vitro uh, experiments might actually be as good, um, in some cases, it, it more relevant than animal experiments. How could that be? Well, if one is thinking about uh, looking at an effect on human genes using a human gene editor, it may be that human cells and tissue culture uh, may be, or, or in organoid culture, um, which is another system, may be more informative um, than uh, just putting that construct into mice or rats or some other species. Um, and we can also use computer modeling these days that can help us. Now, once one has a, a product, one has to do further drug development. And uh, traditionally, uh, one has done absorption, distribution, and excretion metabolism for standard drugs. One needs to understand the potential benefits and the mechanism of action, which for gene therapies, we generally understand. You need to know the best dosage that does apply to gene therapies, the best way to give the drug, uh, essentially the route of administration, either locally or systemically. Um, you need to know about the side effects or adverse events, how it affects different groups of people, how it interacts with other drugs and treatments. And one would like to know its effectiveness as compared with similar drugs. Um, in many cases, though, for what we're talking about here with gene therapies, we're not going to be talking about similar drugs because oftentimes this is the only therapy um, or the only um, potentially really effective therapy that might come along for some of the rare diseases we're talking about. In the drug development world, we have some tools that help us move things along uh, somewhat more quickly. Those include biomarkers. Um, those would be things that help us understand that a drug or a therapy such as a gene therapy might be working without actually seeing the clinical endpoint uh, that we're looking for. Um, those could be uh, trial specific or they could come through a formal qualification program such as a biomarker qualification program that we have. Um, for many of the rare diseases we're talking about, they are going to be rare disease specific because we will not see them come through a formal qualification program generally. We also have the development of complex innovative trial designs. I may mention these a little bit more. And the idea here is that right now our paradigm of going through phases of development, phase one, phase two, um, it works for larger disease entities. But when one only has a few patients that one's studying, we need to start to think about ways of towards ultimately understanding whether the therapy works. And so the concept of Bayesian designs where one, each person that goes through affects the likelihood, the, the pre-treatment likelihood that the next person will respond, either increasing it or decreasing it. And to have some model like that could be very helpful. We also are increasingly using patient-focused drug development because, you know, obviously we need to have clinical endpoints on how people feel, function, or survive, but we want to understand what matters most among those things so that we're not seeing drugs developed for things that uh, they may mean a lot to doctors, but they don't actually mean a lot to patients. Uh, an example of that is for, for many rare diseases, it turns out that fatigue is one of the biggest issue and, uh, uh, and, uh, or inability to do something is a big issue as opposed to uh, some of the medical endpoints like cardiac uh, uh, arrhythmias, in other words, irregular heartbeats or things like this, which bother people um, uh, in, in terms of their day-to-day -day life um, uh, less, although obviously as doctors, we care about them. Um, and then we're also uh, trying to see how we can use real world evidence. And that is, is clearly something uh, for the future that we'll look more into. So normally we have the phases of clinical research um, that I talked about the traditional phases is the initial phase one and typical patient numbers here are in parentheses. So an initial uh, safety and dose finding trial might be 10 to 100 patients. Um, uh, phase two is where you're starting to look for initial efficacy, get a sense of whether the product is effective and get a better sense of the side effects. That's usually in 50 to 500 people. And phase three is when one looks for definitive efficacy and side effects, and that can be from 100 to tens of thousands of people. Um, and then phase four is when you're usually getting additional information, perhaps in special populations or uh, additional experience. Now, that breaks down when you're talking about clinical research for rare diseases. Um, you really have to think about condensing that because you're not going to have the same number of, of 
of patients. And so often we'll see phase one, two designs where there's initial safety and dose finding and initial efficacy. And sometimes then after that, there's a phase two pivotal trial, which might further look at efficacy and side effects. In some cases, it can be a trial where you move from phase one into phase two if you have real good evidence of, of efficacy. After one gets through all of this, one goes and applies to FDA uh, and you have a product application which has information on the product composition, how it's made, the studies that went to support it, both in animals and uh, or, or, or tissue culture cells um, uh, and uh, the clinical trials. Uh, and we then review the product application. We might look at the facilities where the product is made uh, and we'll consult outside experts sometimes prior to approving a product and we can place conditions on the approval if necessary. Ultimately, what we are doing is a, uh, a benefit risk assessment. And this is something that was been over the past five years has become more formalized as part of what we do in every review. So it really is, it, it's something we used to do all the time, but we didn't call it out quite the same way. But a benefit risk assessment is the foundation for the regulatory view of human drugs and biologics. And uh, the, the integrated assessment that we do looks at various dimensions and then looks at the evidence and uncertainties of each of those dimensions. And then we put down what we conclude from uh, that analysis. So we look at the analysis of the condition. What is it that we're treating? Is it, uh, uh, what, what is the nature of the seriousness of that condition? What, are, um, uh, what, what is there? Then there's the current treatment options. What is out there to treat that condition? Is there nothing or are there very good therapies out there? Um, and that's very important. And I think when we come to questions and answers about gene therapies, there might be some uh, questions there uh, about how current treatment options uh, uh, affect things. And that is, is something that is critical in this benefit risk assessment. Um, and then obviously we wanna have a, a good description of the benefit that we believe is with the product, but that also always has uncertainty around it. There are never absolute sure things. There's usually, uh, even for very certain products, there's usually some uncertainty in at least some portion of the patient, so we have to document that. And then there's uh, you know, no product that I know of that doesn't have some risk uh, that has to be addressed. Uh, and then we have to think about risk management uh, and the uncertainty around risk, because uh, we can have risk that's known risk and very well understood, and then we can have risk that's not as well known and less well understood with more uncertainty. So this is a complex piece that actually takes uh, uh, a lot of the skill of the regulator. Now, once we have a product approved, we don't end uh, our involvement then uh, because we know, especially with products that are used in very small numbers of people, that things can come up later on. Um, even in products used in large numbers of people in, in studied in large numbers of people initially and then used in large numbers of people, things come up. So we monitor safety through a variety of mechanisms, including passive surveillance, which means people reporting things that happen to them through MedWatch or other mechanisms. Um, uh, active surveillance, which is us using large databases such as claims systems uh, and claim systems that are linked to electronic health records not to actually get individual people's medical records, but to be able to query those systems to see if certain types of adverse events are occurring. And that allows us to uh, help understand if products are, are safe. Uh, and sometimes we have to ask companies to do safety studies after their approval so that we make sure that um, events of concern are better defined. So how do we provide access to novel therapies? Well. The traditional way is things go through uh, a, a development process with an investigational new drug application culminating in the conduct of clinical trials that lead to the submission of a biologics license application, which was reviewed by the agency and leads to a product approval. Now, our investigational new drug uh, provisions have expanded access provisions within them to allow people access to products prior to the approval. Uh, of, a, of, a, of a product. And those would be either individual patient um, or intermediate size patient expanded access. I'll say a little bit more about those in a moment. 
that's was put in place obviously in order to address this concern that there are people who might not have been applicable for clinical trials um, who might still benefit from access. Um, and so the, these provisions have been put in place so that those who might benefit from a product um, can do so fully knowledgeable of the potential benefits and risks of an unapproved therapy. Now, Right to Try was enacted uh, uh, by uh, in, in an effort to allow people um, who uh, were without other options to have access to products. It is a pathway that is very different from uh, the uh, investigation new drug pathway because it doesn't involve the same subject protections. I'm not gonna say a lot more about that. It's a pathway, ultimately, it, the, it, the similarity that it has to the investigation new drug application is that the manufacturer has to be willing to provide the drug. Um, uh, and, and after that, some of the similarities start to end. Um, uh, emergency use authorization, I, I bring this up here uh, because we are, I would, I would be remiss uh, because we will hear about emergency use authorizations uh, in the very near future regarding vaccines, and you've already heard about them uh, for therapeutic products, and they're for use in a declared public health emergency. These products are investigational products, but they've reached a bar by which um, we are making them available um, because we believe they can uh, address uh, an urgent public health need. Now, I just want to say the conditions for expanded access um, from our regulations are that they have to be, expanded access is, des is designed for serious disease or conditions. Um, and, and that's because why would you want to take uh, a chance on an unproven therapy for something that wasn't serious? Um, there should not be a comparable or satisfactory alternative to diagnose, monitor, or treat the disease or condition. Why? Because again, if there's something that's proven um, uh, to do so, again, why would one want to take this uh, chance? Um, uh, patient enrollment in a clinical trial should not be possible. Um, and, and that's because we'd like to see the people who can be on clinical trials get into them and contribute to the knowledge of the product. Um, uh, the potential patient benefit has to justify the potential risk. Um, and then this final piece that um, the, the providing the investigational medical product won't essentially prevent that product from uh, being uh, developed. And ultimately, as I mentioned before, the sponsor has to agree to provide the product. Now for gene therapies, there are several that are now approved in the United States. Three of these are cell-based gene therapies for uh, cancer indications, these are chimeric antigen receptor T cells. Uh, those are tisogen and glue cell, um, axicathogen and Brex gene. Uh, and uh, there's one uh, for a, a relatively uncommon form of hereditary blindness, RPE65 deficiency, that's or mutations. Uh, that uh, is heretogene, that is a locally administered gene therapy. And then there is one uh, systemically administered uh, gene therapy on the semnogene which really has kind of transformed how we think about rare diseases in terms of being an example of what is possible. Um, so when one thinks about onisemnogene, um, this is a product that was developed for uh, the treatment of patients uh, that were very young who had not uh, progressed to have the, uh, the downside that all of the, the, the loss of muscle function uh, that one has with spinal muscular atrophy um, uh, type one, because normally spinal muscular atrophy, um, it presents early in life within the first couple months of life and you have muscle weakness, kids don't make their developmental milestones. Um, and, and then ultimately um, they end up on a ventilator because they can't breathe, uh, they can, the respiratory muscles don't have uh, strength uh, and they usually die by the time they're two or three years of age. Um, this gene therapy came along after uh, a previous therapy had been developed that uh, needed to be administered on a repeated basis. Uh, and this was uh, with the effort of being potentially a one and done therapy. And when this gene therapy was given to children, um, uh, young in life, you know, at, at age six or so months, and then uh, the children were followed along 
uh, this graphic on the lower left here, um, the major thing to understand is there's a dotted line uh, uh, that's horizontal at the number 40. That's below that, you're not normal on this scale. Above that, you are uh, essentially normal. And you can see that, um, that the children who were treated with this gene therapy who started off not normal, um, the large majority of them end up, 14 out of 15, end up in the normal area. Uh, and uh, the child on the right here, as a child who was brought down to Capitol Hill, um, uh, running around making senators cry um, because of the amazement of seeing really gene therapy um, really transforming a life. Um, and there, there is an example of why, you know, sometimes if you have an amazing effect like this, you don't need to have too many children treated like this to actually believe that this product works. Uh, so this is kind of a motivating factor for us to try to help develop therapies for rare disorders. But there are challenges. There's the challenge of manufacturing, the challenge of non-clinical development, clinical development, and product access. And so I'm just going to finish up my talk in the last five minutes here by just kind of talking through some of these and what we might do about them. Our problem with manufacturing is that in today's gene therapy world, the place there that where there is commercial viability is in the middle size. It's the grande cup. Um, the middle size is, is there's enough sales of those products that people are willing to, to put in the investment to produce them. Uh, and uh, that, that is where a lot of people in terms of the, the companies are, are invested. Very large gene therapies uh, for large populations, that's still out of reach because we don't have the technical ability to make very large, large batches of gene therapy. On the other hand, we do have the technical ability to make small batches of gene therapy. We just don't have the technical ability to do so in a cost-efficient manner. And because of that, uh, a number of these therapies are being left behind. Um, and we already have seen what can happen because in Europe, there was a gene therapy for lipoprotein lipase deficiency that was actually approved and on the market, but it was withdrawn because there were so few people using it uh, in a given year. So it, and it just wasn't commercially viable. So this is where we have to think about how can we do manufacturing better here? And some of that may be uh, by ending up with uh, almost semi-automated manufacturing. For non-clinical development, what we're realizing is that, as I already alluded to, animal models may be less than ideal, particularly when we're starting to think of genome editing. And so we need to start thinking about new model systems such as organized and humanized mice to facilitate safety testing. Um, we also have to uh, think about how we can more efficiently conduct clinical development. And I don't, we don't have the right answers yet. We don't have the answer to this, but we need to work through the dialogue here um, of how do we appropriately document the natural history of disease, uh, collect baseline data on, it, on, on, on rare diseases, and how do we determine efficacy in these very small populations where it's challenging? And this is where this concept of Bayesian clinical trial design may be applicable. And, and then the last and possibly, obviously one of the most important things is that we've been through this whole process of developing a product how do we make sure that it's actually accessible to those who need it? Because we don't want to have a system where it's, it's pay to play. Um, this needs to be, um, uh, we need to be uh, conscious of the cost of access, um, uh, which can otherwise be prohibitive. So we're trying to find ways uh, to have uh, a, you know, a, a way of developing these therapies to bring down the cost of the production of gene therapies for uncommon disorders, or for that matter, gene therapies in general. Um, and that might happen through streamlining the production process, streamlining some of the regulatory things that things have to go through to allow a, a co the cost to come down so that it's possible to treat more individuals, for it's possible for the system uh, in the United States, the medical care system, to start to think about actually accessing these on a more uh, a, a, a more mainstream uh, way. And one of the things we've done with uh, the foundation for NIH, in, and it's a collaboration with the National Center for Advancing uh, Translational Sciences, 
um, is trying to see if there's a way um, that we can do a pilot program to get the necessary pieces in place to leverage essentially doing things over and over again, reusing um, uh, certain vectors that are well characterized with different inserts, uh, basically um, almost like a razor razor blades uh, uh, effect of not having to redesign the razor handle every time you want to use a new razor blade. You just essentially have uh, an adapter that lets you use different heads on the same razor. That's very much the same concept of can we find ways um, to reduce the burden on getting through uh, the development process so that we're not uh, going from scratch to a, to a finalized product each time that we can leverage existing knowledge um, and, and thereby bring uh, benefits of gene therapy to more individuals more quickly. Again, it's a benefit risk here that we have to think about. Um, what can we afford to uh, take a little bit of risk with perhaps uh, that still makes us feel comfortable that the benefit still far outweighs it? And with that, I will stop by just saying that, you know, our goal here ultimately with gene therapy is to weigh the benefits and the risks, uh, find a way forward to help as many people as possible. I think we are cognizant of the fact that we don't have all the answers, um, but uh, this is clearly an area that um, it's tremendously important. Um, and it's, to me, it's what's on the other side of the COVID-19 pandemic um, that needs a tremendous amount of effort. So I'll stop there, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Marks. Um, I am going to share my screen at this moment. Um, I'm Pat Furlong, and I'm going to bring this down to the to the uh, patient. Um, so let me start the slideshow from the beginning. All right. So I I, I really do appreciate your your comments, uh, Dr. Marks, and I, I certainly want to sort of bring this down to a case study on Duchenne muscular dystrophy. I'm from Parent Project Muscular Dystrophy, or PPMD, which is easier to say, and we've done preference studies and looked at benefit risk in gene therapy. And as I, get, I just want to tell you, your slides are not up. Oh, they should be. Let me try this again. Now are they up? Yes, they are. Thank you. Okay, I apologize. All right, so again, I'm going to look at Duchenne muscular dystrophy just as a case study for us to think about. Clearly, Zilgensma um, with the SMA1 children has been incredibly um, beneficial for SMA and certainly a gift to all of us. Duchenne muscular dystrophy is a, an, another rare disease. It's an X-linked disease, so it primarily affects boys. It has significant unmet needs. So this is a progressive debilitating disease where um, Diagnosis, which is a mean age of about four or five years old. Um, from that day of diagnosis or even from birth, we see a, uh, a deterioration of, of muscle, skeletal, smooth, and cardiac muscle. So what's missing here is a protein called dystrophin. It's one of the largest proteins in the human uh, body. And this is a, in the gene responsible for dystrophin is one of the largest in the human genome. So, so this protein being absent in skeletal muscle causes a progressive decline. So muscle cells die over time. And so what we see in the individual is this individual is born weak, but it's usually hard to see unless you're really familiar with it. By the time they're four or five or six years old, you notice that they're not jumping. They can't do stairs. They don't run very well. They never ride bikes. By the time they're 12 or 13, before that, they're falling a lot. They lose, they'll lose the, uh, the use of, uh, or they'll lose the ability to walk. And by the time they're 15 or 16, the arms really don't move very well. In fact, there's such incredible weakness that lifting a hand to their mouth is almost impossible. They use non-invasive ventilation in their late teens and the mean age of death is in the third decade. So, so when we think about this, um, we're looking at dying in terms of SMA1 versus degeneration or death by a thousand cuts. 
because as an individual and I and having two sons of my own, I could see on their faces how loss of that function appears and, and how difficult just doing activities of da daily living. That was a strain not only on them physically as they saw their friends have these independent lives, but also mentally, even for brothers to watch each other. You can imagine when one sees the loss, they, the other one knew it was coming. And the, the ripple effect on the family is incredible. We also know in this disease that the percentage of muscle that's lost is not recoverable. And there are those that say about eight years old, you've lost about 50% of your muscle. So when we think about the, how are we measuring this, we're using the North Star, which is a, a North Star assessment, which is a global measure of an ambulatory child. And, and this is 17 different sort of points on this scale. And when we see in the early data from gene therapy, these children are increasing by two points on the North Star. And one would say, well, does that really make a difference? And in 12 months when you see it, and I'd venture to say, no, in 12 months, you don't see a significant difference. But over time, because of the slow progressive nature, if you can prevent the loss of muscle, then over time, you're going to see a child who's walking longer, able to do the activities of daily living, breathing longer. So how do we think about this? What is the regulatory flexibility um, for Duchenne muscular dystrophy and other progressive diseases? Because it's really important that we think about how to do this because time is everything for these patients and once muscles lost, it's gone. And then when we think about what in Duchenne muscular dystrophy is approved, gene therapy is using a microdystrophin. So, so basically this is a synthetic dystrophin protein that was developed based on individuals who lived with Duchenne but were really never diagnosed because they were asymptomatic. So they used the protein by which their muscle skeletal smooth and cardiac was functioning and created this microdystrophin because of the carrying capacity of the AAB. We also have three approvals that are mutation specific in Duchenne called antisense oligonucleotides. Um, and these antisense uh, drugs basically are amenable to very specific mutations. We have two in X that are amenable to skip exon 53 and one that skips exon 51. And if we look at the individuals who are amenable to these products, they're expressing a truncated dystrophin. In exon 51 skipping specifically, there are four different mutations that are involved in and amenable to that therapy, expressing four different dystrophins whose efficacy may be highly variable. All we know about those proteins is that they're expressed and they're in frame. And there's a rule that says, if you have an in frame protein, that's going to give you some benefit um, as opposed to an out of frame one. So and how did the payers look at these? The payers, interestingly enough, are paying for it in a sense oligonucleotides. And, and the cost of these therapies can be upwards of near a million dollars depending based on the weight of the patient. So if we think about and a million dollar therapy or a half a million dollar therapy over the cost of 20 years, you're talking about a significant investment versus perhaps a one-time gene therapy. So we wanted to ask our patient population about benefit risk here. What were they willing to risk? What, what did they know about gene therapy? And I'm gonna give you a little bit of that and then we can talk about questions here. So what do people care most and least about when deciding about a gene therapy? When we started this study, we began by using this little video that would talk about what this is, that we expected to help their muscles, both lungs, heart, diaphragm, um, and skeletal muscle. We said it's not a cure. We said it, it has the potential to last for a number of years, maybe not forever, and that obviously the more muscle you have, the more likely the benefit would occur. So we wanted to really understand from our patient community about what they thought was important. And, and we used best worst scaling and we did this um, with a, a little over 200 people. So you can see in this, uh, in this outline what they thought was most important. The parents felt that improved muscle function, improved heart function is of the greatest importance here. And they were willing to take a good bit of risk. So we also looked about the risk of death. How willing are you? And for this, we did a threshold experiment so that we could sort of lay out what it would, one in 200 or more than that. And we also wanted to do this in stages of disease, when you're walking well, when you can't bring your arm to your mouth, and in the newborn period, how would you think? And we asked not only the, the parents of these young men, but we asked also the adults with Duchenne, and we learned quite a bit. So this is talking about how we did this, one out of 2,000, um, and in this particular case, and the other 
1,999 would not die. We also use this increasing, as you can see across this diagram, the increasing risk so that we would understand where and at what point they would be willing to take risk. Interestingly enough, what we found is the caregivers and the adults pretty much matched in terms of they, they, were, they had equal thoughts about the willingness to accept risk. And you can see here the willingness to accept risk right now. This is the willingness to accept risk in the very, in, in, as you're walking very well. Later on, we ask about when you, were you willing to accept risk when you um, are in the last year of bringing your arms to your mouth? And you can see from this, again, the parents and the adults are pretty, much, pretty close on this one, <clears throat> but they're willing to take on increased risk at this particular time of being unable to, or last year of being able to raise your uh, arms to your mouth. We also ask about the newborn period, and there was much less willingness to take risk in the newborn period. So what we've learned here is that wheelchair use does predict accepting more risk. And that the last year of lifting arms and, and or the newborn period that we tested couldn't really help us predict that risk. So this wheelchair use does predict the willingness to accept more risk. So here's what we learned. Adults and, and uh, their parents have similar risk assessments. The risk tolerance was highest when you can't feed yourself. And the timing is important. I think there's not a family or a patient with Duchenne who doesn't know that the more muscle you have on, on board, the more likely you are to preserve it, protect it, and maintain function. And that being in a clinical trial doesn't affect this. So you have to keep in mind the story we told as we did this benefit risk experiment. We wanted to make sure that they knew it wasn't a cure, it wasn't magic. So I think that we understand that these families are willing to take risk. We also need regulatory flexibility so that we can think through a progressive disease where loss of function is predicted and known over time and, and rest restoration of a microdystrophin or a dystrophin product is the holy grail. It's what is missing. And so there is an assumption that if you can get some dystrophin back expressed in muscle, you are more likely to preserve and protect what's important to you. So with that, I'll stop and we can do questions and answers. Thank you both so very much for your, your thoughts and, and comments on this. And I, I wanna to turn to the Q&A uh, as quickly as possible to, to fit it in. But, but first I have a question um, for the two of you. So, you know, obviously the Food and Drug Administration has a public health and a consumer protection role but uh, you know, to know what exactly you, the, the patient viewpoint is, you obviously need to have dialogue with the patients and their caretakers and others who can you know, ex explain to FDA, this is the level of risk we're willing to take for this benefit uh, and vice versa. And I know that there has been a, a longstanding criticism, which has been you know, recently uh, lessened that the FDA was not getting that feedback. It was, you know, in its in its uh, ivory tower echo chamber, you know, just talking with scientists and drug companies and not listening to the patients. And I think that that criticism has really diminished over the years. So my question is to Dr. Marks: What is it that FDA has done to sort of proactively, um, you know, learn from patients and caregivers and whatnot? Uh, you know, as opposed to thinking that the FDA has the answers that they will say. And then my question for Pat is, you know, as someone who's been engaged in this, do you, do you really think that we really have made a, a significant change or do you think we still have miles to go? So I'll, I'll let you both respond to that. Yeah, so we, we've, we've started to have patient-focused drug development meetings um, or actually just patient listening meetings. That was actually part of the last uh, it, it became, it's become kind of part of what we're doing. Um, we've done it for various diseases and we often do it on an ad hoc basis as well um, with patient groups. Um, uh, and it's been very, very helpful because we get a variety of reviewers that, that hear that. The other thing that sometimes people don't realize is that a fair number of our medical officers still practice at least half a day a week. Um, and so they're still tuned in to it's not like they're out of, uh, out of this uh, world of things. And, and for, especially for, um, you know, for pediatric neurologists or um, uh, 
uh, uh, pediatric hematologists, oncologists, they still understand very much where the fields are. But that's that's not as as important probably for, for the answering this question is our willingness to listen um, to patients, to, to attend patient advocacy group meetings um, and to understand uh, how important that feedback is. Um, I, I agree that um, I, I can say when I started out in, uh, in, in this kind of path I've been, was on when I was in industry, um, I, perhaps there was easier to level that criticism at FDA because I think in industry, we thought we understood much better than FDA what patients wanted. I think we did um, at that time, but I do think that's changed now. Um, could we do more? We could always do more, um, uh, but I do think we, we've, we've understood um, we've understood that we've, we've encouraged companies sometimes to come in when they have meetings with us, they're perfectly welcome to bring uh, patients with them as long as, as they feel like, if, as long as they're comfortable having the patients there. And that, that's happened now. And sometimes that's very beneficial too, because the patients can explain what, you know, what they've benefited and what they've had as side effects from those drugs. Thank you. I, I think the FDA has been certainly willing to listen. And we've had um, actually a forum and then more recently a compass meeting in Washington where many members of the FDA came to listen and understand. I, th I think what we're trying to do is, is um, sort of see the effect of that. How do you incorporate that? How do you include that in a, in a decision-making process? How is it to come full circle on that as you listen and apply? And I think, especially in these diseases like Duchenne, where it is a slowly progressive disease, which you know is really hard to track. And in 12 months, you don't see the full effect of what any given intervention is going to do. It's the long-term, which is really difficult frustrating on the part of trying to get a rigorous understanding of what is this intervention doing, but also understanding that each day the people on the outside who aren't amenable to the therapy or aren't able to participate in a clinical trial, you know, that they, the worry that they'll never be available for the clinical trial, that by the time this is, this trial is finished or completed and analyzed and a decision made, they'll be outside the window for treatment. So I think, how can we come full circle, make sure we're inclusive and think about um, in 12 months in a progressive debilitating disease, you may not see the full effect. And how can we sort of, I, I, it's probably not rigorous to say for FDA, let's have a leap of faith, but at the same time, how can we embody the humanness of this, the expression of a microdystrophin and then what the likelihood of, of what is the pathway to get that done in a reasonable period of time? And, and I want to hop in simply because we started late and I want to get as many questions in as possible. So we have a question. Do you have a systematic way to integrate patient family perspectives in the risk benefit assessment of new gene therapies for rare diseases? You said earlier there were ad hoc uh, things, but is there a systematic way to do this for gene therapies for rare diseases? You know, we're, we're working on getting there. I don't think I, I don't think I can say it's systematic yet, but but to the extent that there are people are working on guidance about how to do this more systematically, uh, I think we're gonna get there um, ultimately, but it, it's a process and evolution. Then we I, have don't wanna, I don't wanna over, prom, I don't wanna over, <laughs> I, think, I think we are getting better at this. Uh, we, still, we still have a ways to go and we're working there. Then we have a question, how should we assess the risk benefits of gene therapies uh, when there are alternatives available, but for various and sundry reasons, they're non-ideal. So it's not a, there's nothing there, it's an unmet need, but it's a net need. It's just the, the things that are there are not ideal. Like you said earlier with Spinraza about it having to be a repeat administration. Can you speak to that? Yeah, that, this is a fantastic question. I think this really gets to be um, a, a real challenge for us because here, um, uh, let's just use hemophilia as an example. What might be acceptable as what might be very acceptable as a risk for gene therapy for someone who wants to play sports all the time and uh, 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 be a professional athlete perhaps might not be uh, an acceptable risk uh, for somebody who really finds is a couch potato and who's going to be a computer programmer um, and who really wants to, mainly just wants to have something that's not going to cause them side effects. So. 
there's this, this is where, I, because, and that's a really hard one because there you have not just one, but several other effective therapies. It gets more complicated as you kind of narrow the aperture to diseases where maybe there's only one or two other therapies. And maybe just like your example of Spinraza, you don't have something that's really very, so, so there's, there is this spectrum here and we do, we do have to work through this. Now, people are trying to develop more quantitative models of this, where we kind of try to put values, but we're not there yet. Um, and then unfortunately, we're still at the, a, little bit of, um, a, a little bit of eyeballing it. Um, and, and I'm just being honest because we do our best. Um, I think to me, if I had to leave someone with, with my biggest plea to the community, it's that as we do clinical trials, we should try to find ways to do them as inclusive as possible, um, potentially with what some really uh, investigators with foresight have done is they've had analysis populations for efficacy and then analysis populations for safety and efficacy um, and analysis populations just for safety. Um, you're always going to have to, by the way, you always have to, everyone has to be evaluated for safety. So I, 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 I kind of misspoke when I just then. So it's, it's evaluation populations for safety and efficacy and evaluation populations just for safety. Uh, and, and that could be a, 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 an arm that actually does allow people to enroll, you can enroll patients who don't meet the eligibility criteria and with full knowledge of forethought of what the potential benefits or risks with written informed consent, they can enter the trial. Because I think that's the concern about making things available on the market is that once we lose the ability to have a good informed consent process, people can be sold a bill of goods that maybe isn't exactly uh, all they expected. Whereas if people have the informed consent process, that allows them to make an informed uh, choice about whether to use it. So I'm just I'm a big fan of trying to to open up um, inclusion and exclusion criteria and use things like safety arms when we can. As an ethicist, I have to say, you know, obviously I am a big believer in informed consent, but obviously informed consent can be done well and it can be done not well. So that obviously hangs a lot on on yeah. you know sort of the uh, the the validity of the informed consent. I want to go to Pat. Pat, I know you have thoughts about this, about, you know, sort of risk benefit when you have options, but they're just not ideal. Yeah, so, I mean, we've done risk benefit studies and, and we've really looked at the options that are available are not, you know, if we look at the benefit of risk, the, the thing that is available in Duchenne is steroids, right? The benefit risk equation there is, there is benefit in terms of extending the ability to walk several years, depending on the child and, and many other factors. So one to three years, they'll be walking longer, but the, the side effects of the of steroids are tremendous on bone and, and uh, height and, and sort of the whole adrenal, um, the whole adrenal and endocrine um, arena. So the benefits are, are really there, except the, the, the risk outweighs the benefit to some degree as we're learning and we're doing some benefit risk around steroids. I guess one of my questions or one of my thoughts around this is we've worked with CEDAR. We have three approvals in CEDAR, four approvals actually with a steroid being approved in CEDAR. And I wonder, Dr. Marks, um, as we've um, worked with them and work with them on benefit risk, how transferable is that knowledge into CDER as we get into gene therapy? So what is the relationship and how do you move through um, what we've learned there, um, especially in terms of benefit risk, willingness to accept risk, um, and the outcome measures that we're using, and, and also some of the data from other studies? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a good question. We, we, we are, our, our goal is to have essentially seamless um, back and forth between, so that it, if, if CDER is doing it, CBER will and vice versa, unless there is a good reason why it, something for a drug or uh, an antibody wouldn't apply to, uh, or a protein therapy wouldn't apply to a gene therapy. Um, I, I will again acknowledge that we have not always uh, done that well, but I think more recently we've gotten better at that. And as far as I think the current leadership, um, uh, Patrizia Cavassoni, who's acting director of the Center for Drugs and myself, it's one FDA. You, you, you as a, uh, you as a patient advocate, uh, should not have to like worry about what part. It's, it's F, it should be FDA as FDA. You shouldn't have to worry the different parts of FDA 
are going to give you different responses. So that's that's where we're coming to, right? And we're going to try to have it be. Um, uh, Peter Stein, who's the head of the Office of New Drugs within CEDAR, is also very much of that mind. So I think we have a, a number of like-minded people that, that want to get there. We may not be there exactly yet, but I think we're headed in the right direction. So it's one o'clock. I want to be cognizant of that. Dr. Marks, do you have time for one more question or do you need to drop off? I probably, we can do one more question. I'm going to have to drop off because I have to run to another meeting, but thanks. How does the agency address the ethical quandary of a low subclinical starting dose in a phase one gene therapy study, knowing that retreatment is currently not available? It's something that we're struggling with to, to really think about how we can use animal modeling and other things to avoid having to do that. Your point, the point there is so well taken. Um, and actually it's very, it's very appropriate that if anyone, some people on this call may know that today there is a, uh, there is a, and tomorrow there is a, a NIH is holding uh, our, our center in collaboration, with National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences, holding a workshop on immunogenicity of, of AV vectors, because that is, it goes spot on here that we do realize that you treat someone suboptimally and, and that's not a great thing here. So we, we're thinking about how to do it better. You're from an ethical standpoint, I think you're right. You're, 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 you're treating somebody who has the potential for not getting benefit, but even more so than not getting benefit, you're precluding them potentially from getting benefit um, in the future. So we have to work through this and, and find it. We, I mean, obviously in the early days, we need to do that for safety, uh, but now that we're gathering more information um, model systems, et cetera, we need to try to minimize that. I don't, again, I don't have the full solution, but we see the ethical quandary and, and acknowledge it. Thank you. We'll, we'll let you go. And Pat, if you can stay for a minute, we have two Duchenne focused questions that I'll run past you. Thank you but, so much to everyone for listening and really appreciate it today. Thank you, Allison. And thank, thank you for your time. Pat. Take care. So, so Pat, we have a question um, specific to Duchenne that says, what is the stage of gene therapy for Duchenne? Can you just share with our audience where that is? Sure. Uh, there are currently three companies that are work. Uh, there are more than three companies working on gene therapy for Duchenne, but there are three companies with active clinical trials in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Um, uh, two of them, one of them is still in the um, open label. They've had some manufacturing um, issues and so they are coming back online. And two of them, two of the other, both of the other companies are in active clinical trials and entering phase three. Great, and hopefully uh, my tech team will tell me if we're gonna get cut off of Zoom in any second, but uh, I'll try to squeeze this in. So there's a question, Pat, might there be a benefit or need to have a publicly available decision support tool or some sort of educational campaign that, you know, not, not just each individual advocacy group taking care of its own patient population, but, you know, is there a need for just generalized education about some of these issues? Yeah, so we've been doing generalized education, begin, not just beginning with benefit risk, but we and others have done a lot of education around this. We're also working with companies. We have a drug development roundtable, which brings it to these companies together on specific preclinical issues to develop educational tools that um, that really look at various um, informed consent. They look at the immunity issues. They look at the microdystrophin and what it's doing, AV issues in terms of uh, potential side effects, clinical trials, trial preparation, screening, et cetera. So we are developing those tools for patients and, and families. Um, if fortunately or unfortunately in this area, there's many of us in terms of foundations in the US and outside that are creating these tools. So hopefully they're all complementary. I will say in reviewing them, we're all pointing in the same direction of, of trying to help patients understand what gene therapy is, what the potential risks and benefits are, and hopefully our long-term plan. But so I'm going to play devil's advocate here for a moment because this is not actually my area of expertise. And so there's a difference between just sort of educational tools for the sake of like, let's make you more informed and then targeted tools about let's help you make a decision, like taking in mind your values, your option, your opportunities, let's help you decide, uh, decide, do y'all or do any of the advocacy groups you're familiar with actually get into that? And if so, do you think that's something that we should make more mainstream? So I think this is really an important discussion. Most of the time in, in our research, what 
parents do is speak to their healthcare provider to, to really uh, make sure that families feel that their healthcare provider is well informed. We have a certified Duchenne Care Center program. We have 28 centers in the US and two ex US. Um, and, and basically what we do is we certainly have genetic counselors and nurse practitioners in our organization that will give one-to-one -one discussions or will hold one-to-one -one discussions with patients to help guide them. But then we do refer them back to their healthcare professional to make the final decision weighing the risks, both risks and benefits and what this might mean to their child. So I guess the answer is a little nebulous here, Allison. We, you know, we don't offer it as a service where, but, but at the same time, our genetic counselors through our genetic registry are available um, all day. Um, I won't say 24 seven because they're usually available during office hours to have one-to-one -one discussions about your son, the genetic report of your son, what that might mean, what clinical trials he might be eligible for um, and what the benefit and risk of those trials might be. And then they would be referred back to their healthcare professional. Got it, thank you. Um, so we are five minutes over and we still have over a hundred people, which is kind of amazing. Um, and we do have one or two questions specifically for you, Pat. So I'm just going to keep going. And if okay. people drop off, we just thank them so much for coming. And we remind them that we're doing this again tomorrow, talking about equity issues. So same time, same place, different topic. But Pat, we'll keep going for a little bit. Okay, we can keep I have going. a question here. Uh, for Pat Furlong, do you find that whatever risk people are willing to accept is right, or is it the case that some people can be reckless and others are too risk adverse? So I guess based on your, your own scale of what's appropriate, do you think that, you know, we should just let people choose for themselves as autonomous individuals, or I guess in this case, choose for their children, or, or are there people that we should be pushing, saying, go ahead, try it, it's a good idea, or other people that we should be reining in? And if so, you know, how do you draw those lines and, and who, who's on what end of the polls? Well, that's, uh, it's an interesting question. I think having had two sons with Duchenne muscular dystrophy myself, I mean, I don't think reckless was ever my idea, um, or I don't think parents think that way. I think that they want, in general, what we see in advocacy is just by definition of the diagnosis, you become an advocate as a parent, right? Because you have to explain this disease to your primary health care. You have to explain it to your family. You have to explain it to your children and your, your community. So in general, and this is not 100%, but people become well-versed on the disease that they have in their family, in this case, Duchenne, right? you seek out the best care and treatment, and then you go to social media sometimes and seek others who think alike or others can guide you, and you, you, you form sort of a trusting relationship with a few people. I think ultimately these families find and trust their healthcare provider. That's why these certified centers, I think, are so important because you develop this group of people in which you can share your ideas and, and talk about risk and benefit. I, I think it comes back to the whole concept of this disease, right, is missing dystrophin. So our first sort of thought is, could you get this dystrophin back in there, right? Whether it's a microdystrophin, a truncated dystrophin from an anastense oligonucleotide, how can you get it, or a replacement, eutrophin, which that we, we did have a clinical trial with a drug that was suggested to increase eutrophin, which is a fetal protein, but the drug failed. So. I think getting this fundamental skeletal protein back makes sense. So I, I think parents make informed choices. I think our benefit risk demonstrates that, that they think very thoughtfully and carefully about this. I will say that, you know, um, we see the parents and their sons in this case um, have very similar views as well. Um, I, I don't know if, if, you know, we can talk about informed consent and certainly a scent in a five-year-old uh, at least it's been our experience, the five-year-old is going to do what his parents say to do, right, in general. So I, I think it's usually a very well, I don't think it's a reckless decision. I think there may be elements of desperation in all of us. And I used to say this all the time, Allison, you know, um, when, when my boys were first diagnosed, people would say, you're, you're a desperate mother. Indeed, I was a desperate mother. But I did separate that from that emotion from what do we need to do from a very practical, thoughtful way of what can we do to preserve and protect muscle function, to keep them here with me for as long as possible. So I think, I think we are very good 
perhaps not day one of diagnosis, but I think we're very good as human beings and parents of children with this rare disease of making intelligent, thoughtful decisions. Thank you. And I just wanted to let you know in the Q&A, uh, the Parent Project Muscular Dystrophy got a shout out. It says the website has a nice clinical trial decision aid. So good job to yeah. your, uh, your team for that. I have wonderful people working with me. I'm going to close with one question that uh, is cobbling together like five different things from the Q&A. And it's basically about data sharing. So when you are looking at a, at a rare disease, and then you have a gene therapy trial, um, you know, there's obviously natural history data that may or may not be scattered into various repositories or, or perhaps, you know, actually pulled together for, for use. And then you have your trial results, which may or may not be shared freely in terms of, you know, side effects, et cetera, you know, the actual details, not just the report that there was there. From your vantage point in the, the Duchenne you know, world and, and gene therapy, how is data sharing working? Is it, is it everything that we could dream of and more? Is it inadequate? Is it somewhere in between? And, and really what would be your uh, key takeaways in terms of data sharing, whether it's natural history or, or trial data? Data sharing is a big thing with me, Allison. I am really, uh, I think as a community, uh, at, we're all frustrated with the lack of data sharing. We find there has been a, a very large clinical trial done on very young people and very young children um, that I think sharing the data with consortiums like the Critical Path Institute or the CTAP consortium so that they can analyze the data. Um, it doesn't help to use a, a control group that's an old natural history because natural history in rare diseases evolves continuously. So you never have a contemporary rare, or, you know, you never have a contemporary natural history unless we're willing to share this data. So I think that this is why these two consortiums were developed, CTAP and um, the DRISC consortium with the Critical Path Institute to look at disease progression models. I am a proponent and, and a little bit, uh, um, hopefully the NIH isn't necessarily on the phone, but you know they encourage data share. And I, I don't think encourage is the word to use. I think it's a demand. These families contribute their blood, sweat, tears, and time to these studies. And I think the data should be used for the benefit of the patients and the community. So I'm a crazy person when it comes to data sharing. I think companies and their placebo data have to be shared with these consortia so that we can understand and better understand disease progression so that we can better understand and develop better clinical trials with hopefully shorter timeframes and get these therapies to the people who need them. All right, thank you for Pat, that, Pat. So I think we're gonna draw to a close here. I, I wanna apologize that there are so many questions in the Q&A we did not get to, but I wanna say that many of them are talking about topics um, you know, I saw a question about therapeutic misconception. I saw um, questions about, you know, redosing. And all of these are things we're talking about during the remainder of the week. So I just really want to thank uh, Pat Furlong so much for her time and her thoughts uh, and, and participating in this event. And of course, to Dr. Marks, who already had to leave. And I just want to encourage you all to tune in tomorrow. Again, same time, same place, different expert speakers. And we'll be talking about equity issues, who gets into trials, um, you know, uh, what diseases are even targeted for pediatric gene therapy research, the whole, the whole gamut. So we really thank you for your time and we hope you have a wonderful rest of the day. Okay.